Okay, good afternoon. Um, this is kind of a tough task in that I've never grown oak, uh, sorry, winter wheat or barley in, uh, in Iowa. And I'm going to teach you how to grow winter wheat and barley in, in Iowa. But uh, basically, what I, what I tried to do as I put together information for this presentation is I tried to extract from existing data that would give me a reasonable recommendation as to what you might try. And um, I also have some areas that I might point you to some additional sources of information. And certainly some of you will probably have tried to grow either of these two crops in Iowa, and I will ask that you provide some insight from time to time um, so that we can learn together. Okay, so first of all, key winter wheat production practices, and, and I, I want to also preface to say that, you know, a lot of my experiences is a little further north, and so some of these practices may not be perhaps as important uh, for you here as they are for us up there, but uh, hopefully there are some principles that you can learn. So I think that the, uh, the primary factors I'd like to, to, to address today for winter wheat production would be managing for winter survival, fertility management, disease control, and finally varietal selection. How many of you, was it Don this morning, this, uh, right after lunch, he spoke in that group? How many of you went to his session? So, Don? Yeah, we, we covered uh, some, some of these topics he covered, and, and, I, I, and I think that we uh, will cover them again, and you have a different perspective. Okay, so how do we manage for winter survival? And I think for him, you know, winter survival was a non-issue. For us, it's a critical issue. I mean, that's probably why we grow so little winter wheat relative to spring wheat. One of the reasons is because uh, of the risk of winter kill. Um, and basically, there are three aspects to managing for winter survival. The first would be planting dates, just select an optimum planting date. Uh, then optimizing snow catch and how often do you have snow cover in Iowa? In North Dakota, we think you, you never have snow down here. But, <laughs> but it sounds like that probably could be one of the issues that you want to manage for is catching some snow if you have some. Keeping it there as long as you can because that, that certainly um, mitigates the extremes of temp air temperature. And then uh, Varietal choice is really critical because uh, varieties are very different in their ability to survive the winter. So this is a graph that kind of shows you the effect of planting date and how it affects the, the plant's ability to survive the winter. And if we can describe that, this would be our optimal planting date. Let's say that that is the 1st of October, and we'll talk about that, but if it was the 1st of October, you know, planting four weeks earlier than that could be problematic for the plant's winter survival because you actually get a bigger plant, leafier plant, and it doesn't handle the, uh, the cold as well as kind of that optimum size of plant. And then as we get later, what happens here is that the plant doesn't develop enough reserves because while that plant is, is kind of dormant, it's still alive, and so it has to have enough carbohydrate to carry it through the winter months. And so that kind of gives you an idea that we do have a, a window, and obviously that window is a bit of a moving target because every year is, is different, right? I mean, last year I think you probably had a warmer fall than normal, so probably that would have shifted our optimum a little bit this week, this way. You know, maybe this year it'll, it'll shift a bit this the other way. So uh, for planting date, the ideal, uh, in my opinion, would be that you plant it early enough to have at least two to three leaf. Uh, seedling with at least two to three leaves before dormancy. Um, we have actually had winter wheat uh, do well that just sprouted and then went into dormancy. I mean, in other words, it survived. But I think we're talking about an ideal situation. You want to have at least two to three leaves and probably uh, four to five leaves would, would even be better. I think what you don't want to have is, you know, your four or five tillers and, and a fairly big plant. So, you know, that would be kind of a, an ideal to at least two to three leaves. 
Uh, late enough to allow for effective control of winter annual and perennial weeds. And that's one of the advantages of, of you, uh, you can get some of that weed control before you plant and you're not going to have some of those issues. Uh, there are some winter annuals that can be problematic that you can control pretty well in the fall if you, if you time your planting right. And then, of course, the uh, issue of lading, uh, uh, late enough to avoid the green bridge, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Problems of hessian, hessian fly. Anybody ever have a problem with hessian fly? We don't have hessian fly, fly, fly in North Dakota, so I've never seen one. But you know, you do have a potential for uh, problems with hessian fly, and that also more or less will dictate when you should plant. Uh, wheat, wheat streak mosaic virus. Certainly, the later you plant, the less active these mites are that uh, vector the wheat streak mosaic. And so that tends to reduce the risk of that being a problem. And, and again, I'm not so sure that you have problems with wheat streak mosaic virus. I think it tends to be more problems with what we have more wheat in the system, where you're going wheat to wheat, like in Nebraska. I suspect your wheat streak mosaic is more problematic in the east, where you have more wheat on wheat versus, you know, where you have, have less of it. Uh, and then barley yellow dwarf, I think the uh, previous, some of the previous sessions have talked about that because that's an aphid vector issue. Again, as you get colder and closer to the fall, you have less aphid activity and other things, and so the risks of that being problematic are reduced. All right, so I talked about that hessian fly issue, and this is the map for what they call uh, safe uh, fly-free timing. And here we have Iowa. And if we really can't see there, but I think that's about uh, that first ISO uh, line would be about September 20th. So basically the, the suggestion there would be, you know, you, you're free of, of risk of hessian fly if you delay your planting till after the 20th. I think that goes a little later as you get further south, but more or less through the 20th, 24th uh, would be the Hessian fly freeze uh, time. And then, again, I had to look at other data to look at optimum planting dates, and I, I took your neighbor to the, to the west because they grow a lot of winter wheat, and there's a lot of data to to, to look at and so this would be Nebraska and these would be their optimal planting dates and you can see that they range from about the 15th of September to the 1st of October and so I'm extrapolating from these data that that 20th of September to the 15th of October I'm giving you a little more time we might have had a little bit of global warming right because I, I think we feel in North Dakota that we've been able to plant probably a week later than we have in the past in the last, the last few years. So I think that you could probably safely establish a winter wheat crop within that range there. All right, I'm gonna pause. Any of you have grown winter wheat and what's, what, what kind of planting data do you use? Well, we usually try for around the first week of October. So even as late as the 7th of October, you'd be comfortable with that? Yeah. Others, did you? That's been best for us. We went. We went later by three or four weeks. Sometimes it makes it, and sometimes you have to plant something else next spring. Next spring, okay. But again, we talked about, you know, for optimizing survival, it's nice to have a little bigger plant. And, you know, I think probably that first of October, most years are gonna be fine. Uh, you get a little later than that, you might get, might get a little sprout, it might make it, it might not. That's, you just increase the risk of it not surviving. Okay, so that's your first uh, recommendation. And then uh, I mentioned the importance of capturing snow, and this is maybe not the best graph to show that. But if you look at that blue line, that's that surface temperature. And there's lots of, lots of noise around there. And if you could imagine that the, the winter wheat that's growing in the soil is only safe to 20 degrees. Let's say that that's a typical temperature that it uh, can survive. And, uh, and certainly the air temperature gets lower than that during that first part. Uh, the soil itself, we're safe in the soil for some time because the soil is still radiating heat up. And so it's not gonna follow the air temperature directly. Uh, but if we put snow on there, what would it look like? You know, it would basically serve as a, a perfect insulation. 
And the best example I have seen of that is that one year we had a nice snow pack and we had lots of volunteer spring wheat. We planted winter wheat into volunteer spring wheat, or you know, wheat stubble, spring wheat stubble. And there were a few volunteers that we didn't spray out. And then in the spring, that spring wheat was just as happy <laughs> as if it, it thought it was a winter wheat, you know. And it, uh, since it was an experiment, it was a bit of a disaster, right? Because you have all these volunteer spring wheat mixed in with your plots. And so, again, a perfect example that a crop that didn't have any, uh, in, any resistance to cold survived. And so, uh, snow cover really helps uh, moderate that. Now, the one thing I would say, and I think there were some discussions about that in some of the other sessions, that there, you've had these temperatures where they go up, the, the snow melts, you get a little bit of ponding, and then that ice forms. That, you know, that's a, what we call that ice encasement. That's a scenario that really nothing uh, we can, that we have can, can, you know, can work with. We don't have any management technique to, to deal with ice encasement. It just is like, you know, you're, you're, you, wherever you're gonna have ponding uh, ice, you're, or ice form, you're probably gonna have that, yeah. Yeah, uh, one meeting in Minnesota where they talked about possibility of those spots where it either died for some reason of planting a spring wheat into the into winter wheat there in the spring. Uh, have you ever tried that? Yeah, I mean, I think our recommendation is if you want to have a headache, do that. And have, have okay, <laughs> because what happens? It, it fills in the gap, and you want to. I mean, that's the problem, right? Your gap's going to have weeds and other things, but your spring wheat's not going to mature at the same time as the winter wheat. And you know, are you going to? If it's a big enough gap, maybe you can imagine you could combine around it and then come back later, but you know, most people are not gonna wanna do that. And it's probably a couple of, it'd be a couple of weeks difference usually in harvest dates almost, and so. But, uh, you know, I guess if you don't wanna have to see a bare field and you're embarrassed because of your neighbors come by, you could do that, fill it in, but it's gonna cost you another day. Right. I've seen some huge fields in Western South Dakota like that. So how do we improve uh, snow catch? And you know, one would be that we have a, a, a tall re residue crop. Now we're talking about, I think in this case, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, we're probably talking about soybean, winter wheat, corn, or something like that, right? And so your residue crop is soybean. And unfortunately, soybean is not a very good residue crop. It doesn't catch a lot of snow. But uh, you know what I would suggest is that you don't do any tillage. You know, that this becomes a no-till is gonna be to your advantage in the case of this. Because even though your your stubble is not very high, it, it'll catch more snow than if you go out there and do a tillage. Um, so we like to recommend, we actually uh, recommend like Canola flax is a great stubble to plant into. Um, even spring wheat or oats, barley, those are, those are good stubbles because they catch snow. But anything you can do to kind of keep the snow on the field, that's gonna to be to your advantage. And this obviously isn't gonna be enough to, to do any insulation. Here we start to see some potential in, in, in insulation. But I like to share these data it was uh, kind of a fluke in that uh, the data we collected just simply because we had two experiments, one with a soybean residue, one with wheat residue. These are varieties with different levels of, of winter survival ability. And uh, you could see that we lost quite a bit of, of uh, survival of these varieties that weren't really strong in winter survival when we planted under after a soybean residue. With the wheat residue, it really didn't matter. Um, so I guess the other part of that equation is if you're going to plant in a soybean residue, I, I think a, a good recommendation would be to consider varieties that are rated with better winter survival ability. Okay. Um, now you'll you'll probably look at the list and you'll say, well, I really like to grow that one because it high, has high yield. But if you had two that had similar yields, and one that was rated as very good and one that was rated as good, I'd go with the very good uh, if you're going into a scenario like this. And this is just an example of, of the effective variety here. 
we have one of our North Dakota varieties, and that's probably a Nebraska variety side by side. And uh, you can see that with that difference in winter hardiness, we were able to have much better uh, stand in the, in the spring. So kind of my recommendation for managing winter kill, use the most winter hardy adapted varieties, especially if you're gonna go into a scenario where you're not gonna catch a lot of snow. And um, in the case, in your case, I would use those that are rated as very good or excellent for winter survival. And you're gonna tell me, where are you gonna find information like that? And I would suggest you probably go, I mean, my, my sense, if you're gonna grow hard red winter wheat, not soft, but the wind, the hard, I'd go probably to Nebraska. Uh, just, you know, we're right across the border, they've got the same latitude as you. And, you know, if you look at their chart, and you're not gonna be able to read it, but I just wanna show you that chart to show you that there are, you know, these are the varieties there in that chart. That's the level of winter hardiness. I'd go through there, and I would use that as one of my criteria for selecting the variety. I can tell you that the winter hardiness um, ratings come from Mead, which is right west of Omaha, and it's on their, their results the year before, but it's, it's tilled there. So that's, that's what they consider the harshest conditions in Nebraska. Now when we get the Nebraska varieties in North Dakota, some, uh, some years they're going to be our highest yielding. They seem to be higher yielding in general than our North Dakota varieties if they survive the winter. But many of those, especially the ones that are rated very good, will we'll do a pretty good job most years in North Dakota. So I think they'll do fine for you here. Um, the ones that are on the weaker end, then we have a lot more risk. And we try to tell our farmers, don't use those, don't use those. It's just increasing the risk, but sometimes they're tempted to do so. Any Is that question? chart available someplace? Yeah, it's an online thing. So I just pull it up there to show you that you can now, you know, go to Nebraska winter wheat varieties, and that'll give you your chart that uh, I think is a good source of information. Minnesota, you know, they're just to the north of you. That'd be another one you could get the chart from. You can use our charts, but I think a lot of varieties you're going to want to use are probably better summarized in Nebraska. Yes. South Dakota seems to work well. It was good for South Dakota. It's good for us. Okay, so that would be another group to. to, to they've got really and really and they've got an active breeding program there too. So a lot of information on wheat on the website. And on the PFI Small Greens page, we have links to a lot of the different states around us variety trial results. So. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I apologize. I just wanted to show that that that, that resource is available. And thank you for asking because yeah, go to Nebraska. Just Google Nebraska winter wheat variety trials and, and then pop up. And I would suggest you go to the varietal trials that deal with the southeastern part of Nebraska because that's kind of the wetter, uh, more similar zone. You get out west and it becomes more like the wild west out there. It's dry. I don't think that the data applies as well. All right, switching to fertility. Um, you know, for P and K, I would use soil tests and charts that are available. And I, I think you might even use, I saw that in the previous uh, presentation, there was a Iowa State oat fertility chart. You know, in some ways I'm thinking that probably for P and K is gonna work for you. You know, you just, it's based on your level of P and K. Generally in North Dakota, our K levels are so high that when nobody puts K on, and then generally phosphorus, if they've got it, you know, every couple of years of putting it in, they're not going to necessarily put it on in, in, in the wheat. But, you know, you use, use those charts that are available. Uh, the big issue would be, you know, what about nitrogen? Okay, so you're planting in the fall. Are you going to want to put your fer nitrogen fertilizer in the fall? You know, in some ways, uh, logistically, it would be nice to put it on in the fall, and especially if you're doing, you know, I think about anhydrous, you've got to inject it, and then, so it's kind of hard, you either have to do it at the same time you're planting, or you have to do it before you plant, which probably is too early for your recommendation. What's the recommended time to put fall out, fall apply nitrogen? I mean, you must have some guidelines in Iowa. In North Dakota, we say you don't put any anhydrous on it until the soil temperature is below 50 degrees. 
And you know, I'm thinking that your 50 degree soil temperature might occur after your planting of your of your winter wheat. So I'm just sharing that with you that it's a little bit you know cumbersome. It does restrict maybe the way you you apply your your nitrogen. Anhydrous is is one of those things you if you use it you like it because of the price, right? And so and, and the hydrous in the spring is not going to work for you in winter wheat because you've already got your crop planted. But uh, I would say that if you're going to put something on a planting, it should be, um, well, so then I go to surf surface applications tend to be your option. I mean, there are some, uh, a lot of our, you know, air seeders, you can put a mid-row band of nitrogen at the time of planting. But again, that might be a little bit early for most of your nitrogen. Um, and if you're going to do a sur surface application, you might consider a urease inhibitor, something like Agrotane, and they have something that you can put both with the UAN as well as the urea. So they, I know that the UAN is only half urea, but, but nevertheless, it might be worth protecting that half as well. What about the end rate? Um, again, you don't have a chart for Iowa, so I have to extrapolate. Here's what we... Our old recommendation was 2 times 2.5 pounds times the yield goal minus nitrate soil test in the fall minus the rotation credit. So if we're coming after soybean, you get a 40 pounds for that. I suspect what are your fall nitrates like typically? I mean, I've never had any fall nitrates below 40 pounds in North Dakota, but after soybeans, do you get do you get pretty depleted or? <laughs> Nobody checks. <laughs> well, we like to use the fall, the fall nitrate seems to be more predictive than the spring. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, if you find you've got 100 pounds there, then you've got a, a wonderful credit. And you don't have to put on as much. But if I use that guideline and I was going to get 60 bushels, that came up with about a 70 pounds total end, end rate. If we use the Nebraska, what they call use uh, return to nitrogen, for Nebraska, they have charts and they have this kind of complicated formula you can use. And if I plugged in the value for the corp formula, again, they use the soil nitrate test. Uh, and, and they say if you didn't do the test, use five. So five, I think five equates to about 40 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. This is parts per million and this is pounds per acre. But anyway, using their their, their chart, it comes up with uh, 40 pounds per acre. So, I mean, there's a difference of 30 pounds there. That's probably a little less than you put on your corn. But, uh, you know, in our spring, we, we tend to have to fertilize a little higher because we also need to get a little higher protein. Uh, but those, those will give you some rough guidelines as to what your end rate will be. And as far as timing is concerned, uh, I think even Don mentioned that he, in, in, in Kentucky, they put uh, less than 50 pounds on a planting, and I would say certainly not less than 50, and, and it might be that you probably have enough fertility to get the plant started. And remember, what kind, how big is your plant in the fall? I mean, it, it really isn't very big, and you don't need a lot of fertility in the fall. You probably might be able to get by without putting anything on and putting all your nitrogen on in the spring. And then as far as timing is go, generally apply all before jointing. Now, if you haven't grown small grains, maybe jointing doesn't, isn't very diagnostic as a growth stage, but uh, four to five leaves. And again, it gets a little complicated to count leaves because you get tillers, but take the tillers out. Don't count the leaves of the tillers. And so, you know, you're, you're talking about probably just starting to cover all the ground about that time is where we recommend to apply most, if not all, your fertilizer if you're going after yield, okay? Because the size of that spike is determined at that stage. Once you get jointing, you know, once that peduncle starts to elongate, the size of the spike has already been fixed. So the fertilizer is not gonna do anything to help increase the size. So I think that's why our recommendation would be apply all of that before jointing. Yeah. Yeah, organic farmer in Iowa, there's a lot of, we can buy hog manure, liquid hog manure, and it runs uh, 60 some pounds, 60 to 65 pounds per thousand. And 
most applicators don't want to put on less than 4,000 because it doesn't get equal across the width of the applicator. Uh, what possible problems with that higher rate going on? Is it more likely to lodge or anything? Or uh, are you talking, talking about a spring application? No, right about this time of year before. Okay. Yeah, some before the seeding. So it would be the concern about over application? You know, I think in that case, you're going to be in a high fertility scenario. You're probably going to want to make sure you grow a variety that's more lodging resistant. And you can choose from those. Look in the chart. Look for the ones that are a little shorter stature, but otherwise I don't see a real problem. Um, yeah, you'll have a lot of fertility. I don't know if, you know, we always worry about having that much in the fall, right? Because it can sort of change the nitrates and, and potentially move into the environment, but it been an uptake in the spring mill to have that much. Maybe Will it be able to use all of that? 70 pounds and he's going to be ready to more put in 200. No, he won't use all that. So where's it going to go? It's only, I don't know how much would be available the first year, maybe two thirds or less, or I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, uh, assuming that it, you don't get a lot of extra leaching and things, it might be available for whatever else you plant after your winter wheat, but yeah, it's going to be in the soil and at risk of being lost. Yeah. It's probably not a best management practice as far as, so a, 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 a nutrient is concerned. Uh, it, the question was, would it hurt the winter wheat? And I was going to say, not too, not too much. Yeah. It's either that or nothing about the way it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that probably sets up better for a, a corn in the spring where you're going to use more. I don't know if this is the right time to ask this, but I'm organic and the buyer keeps harping on higher protein wheat. I mean, the price is very protein dependent. And he, said that we should put some nitrogen on at jointing to increase the protein in the wheat seed itself that this nitrogen impacts yield but not the protein uh, and and there's something to that's a correct theory meaning that later application <coughs> will will not enhance yield because our yield is more or less fixed but we can enhance our protein and of course, if you're going to put an organic source on, it's going to be one you want to have readily available, right? Yeah. Don't put something on that's going to take a and, month to and release. That's the problem. There are none. <laughs> and you know, and if I was going to load it up, if I was worried about protein, I'd I'd probably load it up. I don't know when you can in winter wheat. That's a problem. It's it's either in the fall yeah. or so you'd have to overapply in the fall. Maybe overapply in the fall. Some Unless you've got something that will 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 go on in the spring, okay. You know, I, I'm not exactly what sources you have. Yeah, we we did some top dressing on organic trials in, in uh, Nebraska uh, a couple of years in a row. We need to, needed to have something we could spray on at boot stage. So that that boosted some varieties up to one percent. Some it decreased because I think uh, I think it increased leaf spotting diseases so so it depended on the variety but i don't know if you want to do something like that or not. i don't i don't either i just try to keep my buyer happy and and uh, we're trying to plan next year's program and, and the other thing i would do is i look at the varieties and make sure you uh, you uh, you grow a really high protein variety i mean the range is not that great but they're certainly within one point difference, and I would be more on the higher end. You know, we have a variety of spring wheat we call blend. It doesn't yield all that well, but it has a full point percent protein more than, than others. What are you talking, you're talking 12 or so? Or what oh, we're talking, four, we're talking 14, it'll have 15. Oh, okay. And, and so the organics like it. Well, they may end up with 14 or 13 and a half, but at least they're still in the market. We kind of need a winter wheat for our yeah. No, I'll I'll show you. Uh, you know, we, on that same chart I showed you that showed the yields and the right. winter hardiness, yeah. it'll yeah. list the protein I've, I've contents. That, but yeah. but you, don't you don't have that many to choose from, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, to the extent that you have, you can. That would be another strategy. Say, while you're still on um, management fertility. Uh, do they ever do uh, starter fertilizer for phosphorus to increase 
early growth? And well, so yeah, one of the recommendations was that the phosphorus at planting will help improve winter hardiness, but I, I think my own research would suggest that's really only an issue if you've got kind of a low P status soil. I wouldn't be overly concerned about putting extra P in the PR. It didn't seem like we, we got much benefit from it, but you know, the classical recommendation was P helps with winter hardiness. But again, I think if you're deficient, it, that that's when you have mm -hmm. a problem. But if I was thinking more of like a late planting date when the soil temperature gets a little lower. Just so you have better access to it. Yeah. And that and it might be the case. Um, as far as disease management, we've got uh, wheat streak mosaic virus, uh, foliar diseases, and fusarium head blight. Um, you know, the wheat streak mosaic is a virus that's vectored by this little critter here. It's actually a mite. It uh, <clears throat> usually is, it seems like it's going to be everywhere present. You know, it's a, it's a mite, you know, yeah, it's just going to be there. I don't know how it survives, but, um, and typically it gets its virus from carrying it over from the previous year. And a lot of our problems is it, it carries virus from a winter wheat that's a volunteer, it'll carry it in the spring wheat. The spring wheat will then carry it to the winter wheat and the cycle continues. I don't know how much, how problematic wheat streak mosaic virus is going to be in, in Iowa. Nebraska, how big of a problem? Well, it's, some years it's really bad that there's one variety that's uh, usually low yielding, but when they have uh, maybe once every four or five years, be a big outbreak. Um, the, that variety will be at the top. But if I, there's a green bridge. I, I'm thinking yeah. that you, with as little wheat as you have, and especially uh, winter wheat that's kind of br bridging over to, to spring cereals, it may not be a problem. But let me just talk about the strategies. <coughs> is the way you control it is you break the green bridge, and what the green bridge means is that there's grassy wheat, because uh, any kind of grass, the ho that, that serves as a host for the mite. And so just imagine that the, this thing can only live on a green plant. And as soon as that plant turns dry, it gets up on the edge, the wind blows it until it finds another green plant. And then it will go back and forth, right? And so what the, the strategy is if you make sure there's nothing that's green out in that field that you're going to plant in two weeks prior to when you're going to plant, you're not going to have a problem with the wheat streak mosaic virus. The only exception might be that there is the potential from the, for the mite to move from corn. So the mite is actually in the corn. I don't know exactly if it's, if it, it'll support the mite. I don't know if it really likes the corn. But I have seen pictures, you know, where the winter wheat was right next to the corn. They moved in and you had problems with wheat streak mosaic right along the corn line. Uh, but again, I'm not overly concerned about that. I plant a lot of winter wheat next to corn and I haven't had any particular problem. But uh, if you have grassy weeds out there prior to your planting, uh, there's a potential that they have uh, some virus. And if you control those two weeks before your winter wheat, that's going to be to your advantage. And this is just a picture, you know, that's kind of our volunteer issue. There's probably some mites there with some virus. If you can keep it browned up before you plant, there's very little risk of having the virus problem. Then our, um, our foliar diseases are tan spot, and tan spot really is a problem in wheat on wheat, so I think your, your problem's more going to be septoria, and then, um, and then these rusts. And the rusts are a little uh, predictable because they get blown in. So, you know, I think in the previous uh, presentation they talked about uh, oats rust being uh, overwintering on Barberry, but a lot of our rust will actually blow up from Texas and whatever. And so you're right in the pathway as spring comes along, what happens? That rust from Texas and further south is going to be dumped on you and then you get some problems. The thing here is you just keep an eye out for it. You know, you've got to have favorable conditions, but it's also you've got to have wind that blows up the rust. Um, 
So we have one of our recommendations, uh, I think if you listened to Don earlier, he said that they spay, spray fungicides two to three times. And some of our growers will put on an application at the time of the herbicide. And that will be for, you know, tan spot septoria. But again, and, it, and it's cheap, you know, they say, hey, it doesn't cost me anything because I'm already spraying uh, for the spray. And I'm only using a half rate of a generic. It's a couple of bucks an acre. I'm just going to put it in. But the thing is, if there's no disease out there, save your two bucks. Put it in your pocket. Go, go have a night out or something. Uh, because uh, the residual effect of these fungicides is not that long. And I, I, if you don't have any disease developing, I mean, it's something you could scout for prior to your application of your herbicide to see if you want to do that. But that would probably be septoria, you know, kind of a foliar disease. Um, this is just to show you that uh, certainly in our winter wheat, we see a much bigger response to fungicides. This would have been two applications of fungicide, one at, at planting, or one at uh, herbicide timing and one at, uh, at, um, at flowering. And we see that much bigger response in the winter wheat. It just doesn't seem to have the disease resistance package that our spring wheat does. Now, the big one is going to be your uh, fusarium head blight. So this is, the, um, this is the one that causes the accumulation of dawn uh, that the elevators don't like. It overwinters on cereal crops, including corn. Do you have corn in Iowa? Absolutely. So are you going to have problems? You're going to have problems with fusarium head blight. It likes warm temperatures, uh, et cetera. Uh, it produces this mycotoxin. Uh, that's what they don't like. Uh, advisory is that you know, our food, we should have less than one part per million of Dawn. And usually the grain millers will buy up to two parts per million Dawn because uh, they can mill off. That Usually that one part comes off in the brand. Um, uh, but if you have more than two parts per million, you, you either get a big discount or they won't buy it. And so there's your residue. There's the spores, it, uh, it attacks the head right in there at that timing. And these are the symptoms of the, the blight. And if you have it really bad, this is what we call these tombstones. You've lost some yield and you've also got very high levels of dawn, which will make that seed unsellable. And you know, they can, you can sell it to, I think the one question was asked, what, what do you do when you have high levels of it? And Don this morning said, well, we sell it for animal feed, but if it's really high, you can't sell it for animal feed. I, I think chickens have a certain level and cows have a certain level. And uh, we had a lot of growers that just had to, it's, it's expensive to get rid of. You, know, you had to burn it, you had to spread it, you know. So it was a real negative thing. The forecasting models can help predict uh, I think you saw that. Uh, this is a national one. Look at that. You can get a little bit of Iowa in this particular picture, showing there's some high risk on that day. Use that to help. It's not uh, uh, fell safe, but uh, it'll help you predict. And the recommendation is that you uh, apply uh, your fungicides uh, with an 80 degree flat pan nozzle and use an angle like this. You know, we typically put that herbicides like that, we want to have an angle like this so that the head is likely to get um, covered. And uh, I think Don this morning said he used 20 gallons. Uh, minimum we recommend is 10 and uh, try to get it low to the camp. And then these are the fungicides that we think are the best uh, for Sara and Corumba. These are seeing a, about a 50% reduction in Don levels. Folicure is a lot cheaper, but it doesn't do as good a job. Tilt doesn't do a good job at all. It'll kill your other foliar diseases, but it won't do anything for fusarium. And this is the right stage as it's early flowering when you see those green anthers poking out. This is a little bit late. And for barley, you want to put it on this stage right as it comes out of the boot. It's got a different stage because barley actually flowers while it's still in the boot. Hurry on here just to show you that you know probably resistant varieties. Look at look at the dawn levels in a moderately resistant variety compared to a susceptible one. 
that's the big factor. So if you have types that have more resistance, I would suggest you select those that are more resistant to start with. And then still having your program, I'm going to put some, some fungicide on, but start with the most resistant that you can. And those charts will have some of that. I mean, there's probably only three or four. Uh, Lyman out of South Dakota, um, Emerson out of Canada, Overland does pretty well. Those would be three that come to mind that are have in the winter wheat class that are pretty good for scan. Not great. And then for varietal selection, I would say use data, as I mentioned earlier, from eastern Nebraska or southern Minnesota. Use multiple years and locations. Uh, if I looked at the southeastern Nebraska website, it, it listed S.Y. Wolf, Freeman, Cedar, Ruth, and Overland as kind of the top ones that, uh, as far as yielding is concerned. Any of you are familiar with these? Any of those? Which one are you? Wolf. Wolf? Yeah, we, we actually grow quite a bit of that in North Dakota, so it must be well adapted. Yeah. It's, uh, it stand, it's kind of shorter stature, stands up pretty well, and it'll probably survive the winter if it makes it up in North Dakota. Uh, it's not one that we would say is scab resistant, but can't have everything. Any quick questions about winter wheat before we switch to barley? I've only got four, four or five minutes. You're going to get some, right? <laughs> okay, my buyer's complaining about low falling number. He explained falling number and what sure. we can do to improve it. Sure. So falling number is an indication an indication of the status of your starch, okay? And you got to have good starch to make a loaf of bread. And what happens is that probably prior to harvest, you had a little bit of rain or heavy dew, and that kernel decided it wanted to germinate. It may have not germinated, you wouldn't have seen anything necessarily, but you had premature germination. And what happens is there's an enzyme that the, plant, that the seed needs to break down the starch so it can start to grow. And that enzyme, once it's broken down that starch, they, yeah, then, then you have a problem. And, and the way they measure that is they make a slurry from your grain, they take the grain, grind it up really nice, make a slurry, they heat it up, and then they put a rod with a little fan thing on the bottom and they count how fast it will fall. That's what the falling number means, is that little rod is falling. And if it falls like that, you don't have any starch of any value. Can that be brought about by harvesting at a higher moisture and then having damp, humid weather and not being able to run as much air on it? That could be, right. It could be something that has happened in storage. You know, certainly that's a possibility. Uh, but typically it would be something that happened in the field and a lot of times, you, you know, some varieties are, are more resistant to free harvest sprouting than others. Uh, but typically what happens is the seed, when it's wet, is not necessarily going to sprout right away, right? Because otherwise, all of, you know, <laughs> the seed at some point is going to have 40% moisture and it's going to dry down. And, it, and so typically what happens, it will dry down to 18 or harvest moisture or whatever, and then it gets wetted back up. And that's when the problem occurs, is when you get wetted up. And, and usually it's after a, you know, a little prolonged time because that seed is not now starting to think, well, it's been long enough, I want to start to, to germinate again. But uh, so my recommendation, you know, is, is if it looks like it's gonna rain tomorrow and you're at 18% and can bring it in and put some air on it or something, it's probably better to harvest it earlier rather than to set it to have it exposed to prolonged periods of, of rainfall prior to harvest. In uh, North Dakota, do you uh, take it standing or you wind row or you strip yeah, red? We, or? We, we take it almost all by standing and we do another practice that's not very popular is we apply glyphosate pre-harvest. You didn't hear me say that. <laughs> what was that? <coughs> Sometimes. I mean, if you've got a lot of green things, I mean, in a, in a fall where you're really up against the wall uh, for getting out there to harvest, that's kind of one of those practices. And, and I don't know if it's going to be around that long. I mean, I'm speaking very frankly because it's something the industry doesn't like. They don't like to find glyphosate in the green. Uh, they didn't mind about it in the past because it's a very low toxicity chemical. Uh, but you know, once the Europeans made a big deal out about it being carcinogenic, uh, 
they started checking my email. But uh, in you know, in the old days, if they had a feel like that, where they would have uh, went around it and then came back and, and combined it. But it's just you know, it's so much slower than direct harvest. Almost all of our time is direct harvest. Yeah, you're gonna have to delete that from the, the web. <laughs> Other questions? Ten minutes for barley. Okay. <laughs> How many of you have some interest in barley? Whoa, that's what you yeah. came for. Yeah. Oh, I better hurry up. <laughs> okay, so barley is quite versatile in that it can be used for malt feed, food, and fire. And I don't know in Iowa what the most interest will be, but I think we have generally a growing interest in the use of barley for malt uh, in non-traditional areas. And um, and one of the reasons is, is if you look at the price, the blue bar would be the price for malt and the red bar for feed, and you can see that it's almost double the value in some years. So, and, and you know, and the other thing in Iowa, you have a lot of corn that can feed the animals, so the market for animal feed is not the same as it is in Canada. Canada did do a lot of barley for animal feed, but they don't have any corn. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't some added value of using the barley for animal feed. Uh, I mean, I think it is a good source for animals. But, but making malt, if you think malt is, if you think it's hard to satisfy the customers for wheat, then you could, you know, me meeting the requirements for malt is really, really tough. So you've got to have very good germination. You've got to have moderate level of protein. It can't be too high. It can't be too low. You've got to have good moisture, uniform, plump kernels, etc. Um, so, what do I think your main challenges and I will be? One would be the dawn levels at uh, Fusarium we talked about, and the other would be plump, and probably plumps because of disease, not because you don't have good environment for growing barley. Uh, I think environmentally you probably do fine with plumps. Our problem with plumps is that we run out of water, you know, and, and so we get skinny kernels. But you'll you won't run out of water you're going to have to deal with diseases. And that's, uh, you know, once you lose your leaves, you're going to lose pumps. So where do we plant? Uh, I don't follow corn. Um, I'm going to talk about variety selection. Uh, basically, uh, if you want to grow for malt, you're going to have to grow one of those that's approved for, for malting purposes. It's approved by AMBA, OK? So you don't get a lot of flexibility here. Unless you can negotiate something with a local malt house, whatever they want, you can get it to them, right? But generally, in, in the national market, you've got to have one of these. And uh, we actually have two types. I mean, there is the possibility of growing a winter barley. Now, here's one, Wint malt and thoroughbred are two winter barleys that are approved for malting. All the others are spring types. Are you interested in growing barley in spring or in the fall? Doesn't matter. I, I mean, I, I, I'm going to talk mainly about growing barley in the spring simply because there's so little information available for malting in the winter. But you can see that is an option, and, and you know, I, I think I'd be interested if I lived in Iowa to test some of these things. You know? And the problem with barley is it doesn't survive the winter well. I, I tested one variety that was given to me that was supposed to be the most winter hardy, and not one single plant survived. And I've never seen that happen before with my winter wheat. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's the thing. But there is a growing interest in two-row barley. I just want to say that here. So maybe your interest would be for two-row types. They tend to have bigger plumps. They, 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 uh, and the thing is that if you look at what's the growth in the brewing industry, you know, 12% of the total beer sales is, is in the craft brewers, but look at that. They use 25% uh, of all the, all the malt. Um, so this is just some data on varieties, and, and I think I'll pass over that only to say that, you know, we have a couple of varieties, uh, two row varieties that have very, that have genetics for low protein. And this might be an advantage for you if you have this issue of having high protein of, 
uh, you know, genetically these end up with a full point or, or less uh, protein, really nice and stressed environment. There was a trial that was done throughout the eastern part of the U.S. to see if, because there's, you know, it's not just Iowa that's interested in growing barley, I mean, the whole, especially in the east coast where they have big population centers, they want to grow malt so they can have the malt uh, from field to, field to bottle, I guess. And so this trial was done to kind of see the potential for that. Uh, this is, I think Purdue might be the data that would be most representative and look at the average of that trial yielded 51 bushels, protein was fine, Don was a little bit high, plumps were definitely below standard, and this RBA is, is kind of like that falling number thing, it's a, an issue of sprout, and you can see that that was unacceptable. So I mean, these data suggest it's not gonna be that easy to grow barley in a wet environment like I would. So I'm not, I'm not gonna stand up and cheer for growing barley, I'm saying that there are some challenges. Um, but of the of these varieties, the six rows in Purdue, Lacey, Robust, and Quest were the best, and the two rows, ND, Genesis, Pinnacle, and Connor, and you know those 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 are all from North Dakota. I would, if you're going to go spring barley, I would plant early. You know, what is early? Yeah, you know, I think I think probably that first week in March, if you can get out there, fight the snow if you have to. Uh, earlier the better. Um, here's some data kind of looking at North Dakota. Our, that's first of May, but this is way up by Canada. For yield, it declines as you plant later. Your protein goes up and you don't want to have high protein. And the plumps actually, there was some variability there in, in the optimum for the plumps. And once, yep. When, sorry, when you say high, you don't want high protein, is that just for malt? What about for yeah, for feed it wouldn't matter. I think probably high protein for feed would be great. But for malting, they don't like it. Um, I think it's because you have more enzymatic activity with it and it affects that whole growing process. Yeah, for feed, I think most people would say, yeah, more protein is better. Uh, this would be optimum seeding rates. I would put it somewhere between one and one and a half million. And that would apply to both the two-row and, and six-row types. Uh, remember that higher seeding rates are going to induce a lot of lodging, and barley doesn't have as good a straw strength as the, as wheat, so you don't want to you don't want to go over the top. Foliar diseases, you've got a whole bunch of them to deal with, just like in uh, wheat. Um, again, you've got the issues of the rust will blow up. The uh, the others are foliar diseases, and again, I don't know how problematic it will be if there's never been barley grown. I was in Ethiopia, and uh, it was a rainy, humid kind of place, and there wasn't one disease speck on the leaves. And I'm going, how is this? And these were old varieties. It's not like that. And I think the reason is they took every bit of residue to feed their cows. You know, so when at harvest there wasn't anything. Uh, and it might be the same scenario. If you don't have any, you know, kind of small grain residue kicking around, maybe you won't have some of the issues with some of these polio diseases that we have in North Dakota. But, you know, it's the same kind of thing. Most of these are easily controlled with fungicides. Um, uh, this is one of our varieties at Pinnacle. I'm not sure I'd recommend it because it really did have problems with uh, foliar disease. Um, and uh, again, the uh, fusarium is going to be your big bugaboo. And the same story as winter weeds, you're going to want to put your fungicide on. At, uh, in this case, the best time to put it on is right at that stage when most of your heads are just emerging. Because, you know, the, the flowering takes place here. And so actually, barley is, is more resistant to uh, fusarium than wheat in some respects. Remember. I think one of the previous speakers talked about that the, the pathogen actually takes the anthers and follows it into the seed. Well, it can't do that in barley, right? Because it's already had it. I mean, and it's, a, it's already, that flowering process has already occurred. And so what happens here in, in barley is you don't have the yield loss that you do in wheat, but you still get it on the outside of the, uh, of the kernel. 
and the brewers really don't like it at all. It causes something called gushing. Any of you know what that means? I guess when you take the cap off, half your bottle comes gushing out. So you can imagine people don't like gushing. But that's that's associated with Don levels in barley. And again, I think the same chemicals, full uh, Persaro or Caramba, would be the recommended ones. And um, I know I'm about out of time. Uh, managing for protein. The only thing I would say here is you have to, you know, in the spring wheat I talked about, or winter wheat I talked about 2.5 times the yield goal. Yeah, in barley, we're talking about 1.5 times the yield goal. So we're really reducing the amount of nitrogen that goes in because we don't need the, the, the level of protein in the seed. And this is a very complex graph just showing you that this. You know, this is probably the optimum is about, you know, one pound for every expected yield uh, out there. I don't know if you're interested in this, but this is the last slide I have, just kind of showing you our production costs in 2016 comparing Marty to corn. And our total production costs were 346 um, compared to 510 for corn. And I guess you'd have to put in there what the value of that uh, was at the end of the day. But uh, if you don't make malt, you know, you're giving up about half your yield or half your profit. Uh, so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a risky game, but uh, very interesting. I think people that are in this, and I would say if you want to embark on this, you know, starting a, a gradually and, and have. Have a market in mind. If you've got an if you've got a, a, a maltster or somebody that's local that wants to try some, you know that's kind of how, how I do this story. Any questions? One question. Anybody still want to try party? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the fallback uh, certainly is for feed, right? Uh, and I think that. Uh, Again, I don't know what your market is for, for barley. I mean, if you have your own animals, it's it's easy to put money if you've got to sell them. Oh, are there any barley breeders in the northern part of the nine? Uh, so Kevin Smith in Minnesota and uh, Horsley. I think there's some old North Dakota to make the And then, uh, you know, there's a couple of companies that breed varieties that I don't think they're as vigorous as they were in the past, but. Well, thank you very much for your interest and all the best.